our next speaker is Nakea Pennen. She comes from Clark University in Atlanta. Her talk is uh, titled CXCR4 CB2 Heterodermer Antagonizes CXCR4 Mediated Metastasis and Tumor Growth in Vivo. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, my name is Nakia Pennett. I'm a PhD candidate at Clark Atlanta University. I will go straight into my talk for the sake of time. <laughs> so um, the primary reason why cancer is so difficult to eradicate as well as um, just difficult to treat overall is due to the fact that it can spread throughout the body. Um, typically what happens is in metastasis when it occurs is that the cells, they detach from the primary tumor. From there, they then penetrate the tissue, um, they then intervascularize uh, into the blood vessel, and then they begin to circulate. Um, and once they circulate, they eventually attach to the blood uh, vessel wall. From there, they then migrate out, and then they form this col uh, metastatic colonization that occurs um, typically in, um, in this enriched um, in this enriched uh, tumor microenvironment, some of the factors that actually contribute to that are something called G protein couple receptors. And these GPCRs, they also have these chemokine receptors that essentially um, they enhance um, cell growth, um, metastasis, as well as cell um, homing as well. So GPCRs, um, they are some of the largest family of cell surface receptors in the human genome. Um, when the GPCR's agonist um, binds to the receptor, typically what happens is, is that this disassociation of the G um, protein unit that consists of G alpha, beta, and gamma, um, when this disassociation occurs, it's an exchange of GDP to GTP, and then it forms this signaling um, cascade that occurs. And when this happens, um, coupling happens between the GPCRs, and traditionally there's two models, a monometric GPCR as well as a heterotrimetric um, G protein. And they form this physical association or this pair, either through dimerization, either homodimerization or heterodimerization. So as you can see in A is homodimerization, where you have two like GPCRs, and when their agonist or their ligand essentially binds, typically you have the signaling cascade that happens with the disassociation of the G protein subunit, and you usually have um, amplified signaling. Um, however, in the heterodimer model, what happens is that you have two separate GPCRs, and um, typically you have its agonist, in this case, this orange one here will bind to GPCRR, and then GPCR2, um, you would have this green one. And essentially what happens is that you either have amp amplification of signal or it can also inhibit signaling. Um, and this can be a benefit in many cases, especially when um, you have a metastatic G protein couple receptor. In our case, in my lab, we look at CXCR4, which happens to be a metastatic GPCR. Um, in fact, when CXCR4 is activated by its agonist, SD1 alpha or stromal derived factor alpha 1, I mean 1 alpha, um, and it's ligand CXL12, what happens is, is that it has all these signaling cascades that occur that actually um, enhance and further drive um, cell density homing, um, proliferation, as well as overall metastasis and cellular movement. Um, the overexpression of CXCR4, what happens is, is that um, it actually causes metastasis, invasion, migration, and it's also known to kind of be a metastatic predictor in the fact that um, it's a key participant in determining overall tumor aggressiveness as well as overall um, mortality, mortality associated um, metastasis as well. Um, with that being said, it is one of like the key targets in early and late stage disease management. Um, in the fact that if we're able to antagonize CXCR4, we can actually um, kind of slow down or reduce the utilization of cytotoxic drugs, as well as reduce tumor growth and overall metastatic burden. But hey, on a lighter note, there are GPCRs uh, that are actually anti-tumorogenic. In this case, we have cannabinoid receptor 2, the receptor that we look at. But these cannabinoid receptors, um, they consist of cannabinoid receptor 1 and 2. Typically, 1 is found in the brain, epicytes, as well as the GI tract, whereas your CB2 is found in your immune cells in various different tissues. Um, these cannabinoid receptors, they're getting um, a lot of notice due to the fact that the increase of looking at medical marijuana as a therapeutic tra treatment for um, cannabis. So with that being said, um, literature has shown that these cannabinoid receptors, they are anti-tumorogenic and they can pretty much 
um, cause the divination of angiogenesis, as well as um, inhibit um, overall metastasis and cell movement, cause apoptosis and cellular arrest. With that being said, one of the major questions that um, my PI asked some years ago was whether or not we know that CXCR4 is this metastatic GPCR. CB2 happens to be an anti-tumorant genic uh, GPCR. So we know that they can form these heterodimer pairs. So why can't they be a viable target for prostate cancer metastasis? So what we did um, in vivo, looking at both prostate cancer and breast cancer, we were able to see when we um, treated CXR4 with its agonist, SD1-alpha, we saw that it pretty much functioned normally, formed this homodimer, um, the homodimer pair, and you got the signaling response where we were able to see that it increased uh, migration as well as other cellular movement. The reciprocal happened in uh, cannabinoid receptor 2, where we saw it was anti-tumorigenic and it prevented cell migration overall. And then when we form this heterodimer pair by actually simultaneously treating SDF1-alpha and AM1241, we were able to see that these receptors, they do still bind um, to their appropriate receptor and agonist or ligand uh, functions, but how, and they do not compete either. But what happens is, is that it actually prevents um, this um, met metastasis and overall cell cellular um, motility in the fact of, in the association of actual uh, cytoskeleton rearrangement. Um, with that being said, since we were able to do it in vitro, then we should be able to do it in vivo, right? So that's where I come in. Um, so the overall thought is that if we're able to form this heterodimer pair or phenomenon um, in vivo with prostate cancer cells, we should see an overall decrease in tumor development, specifically in um, tumor progression as well as um, metastasis as a whole. So I worked in collaboration with the Tanya Sonanova lab at UCLA in the molecular and medical pharmacology department. Um, she engineered this D145 RFP loose cells in conjunction with this um, spontaneous metastasis model. So before we went in vivo, we wanted to definitely confirm whether or not her engineered cells, we would see the same phenomenon if we um, pretty much activated this heterodyne repair. So for starters, we wanted to um, look at migration as well. In vitro, so we did a scratch moon assay just to test, as well as a major gel drop assay that looked at both migration as well as invasion. So um, our, our in vitro studies with our scratch moon assay, pretty much I treated with DMSO as a control, SDF and alpha to activate the CXCR4, uh, AM1241 to activate cannabinoid receptor 2, and then that combo treatment of the simultaneous um, treatment of SDF and alpha and AM1241 to essentially form that heterodimer model. Um, so over the course of 12 hours, um, at 12 hour interviews of intervals, I did take images and um, we could see as early as 24 hours that there was a significant difference between the DMSO group and um, combination treatment group. And that at about 46 hours, we saw that there was significant difference between the DMSO group and the combination treatment group, as well as um, SD and alpha. And even we saw some significant difference between AM1241 and DMSO in SD and alpha. So just further confirming that we could reduce migration. So when we looked at this major gel drop assay, so um, this white line indicates the original drop that we did. Um, and we were pretty much measuring the relative invasion area. So all the cells that kind of migrated out and invaded out, that's what we're measuring. So we were able to see uh, with this combination treatment group that it did significantly reduce the relative area of invaded cells. Um, and we also saw that AM1241 still had that same exact effect as well. So now that we could confirm that in vitro, um, we could reduce metastasis as well as invasion, we now move to this spontaneous spont uh, metastasis model in which what we did was we injected DU145 RFP loose cells um, in these NSG male mice. From there, we allowed the tumors to reach 40 millimeter cubed. Um, I then divided them into those four groups that you saw in vitro um, to either, you know, mimic CXR4, cannabis receptor 2, and then that heterodimer model here. Um, so from there, I did daily IP injections measured every, single, um, every three days. Once the first um, treatment group reached 400 millimeter cube. I then removed the tumor, looked at actual tumor uh, growth as a whole, continue IP injections. If you would think in a clinical setting, if you have a patient that has a primary tumor, you remove it, uh, would it cause regression? Would you see um, kind of like metastasis in the other organs? So we did uh, track metastasis by doing full body luminescence through IVS, looking at um, imaging at two and three weeks. And at three weeks, we ended up harvesting the organs, looking at 
the lung, kidney, um, reproductive organs, um, lymph node and bone. Um, and I'll get into what we actually, what organs we saw um, metastasis in. So what happened was just looking at tumor uh, growth as a whole or tumor progression, we did see that um, this combination treatment group uh, does re reduce the tumor size, but overall tumor weight, we didn't see any significant difference. Um, and then we also accounted for overall tumor volume and as well as the overall fold change from day zero when we divided them into that group to day 31. Um, we were able to see that there was some significant difference in the tumor volume compared to the combination treatment group amongst all the treatment, um, different treatments. And then just for the overall tumor fold change, we saw that there was a significant difference between the SD1 alpha and the combination treatment group. Um, so at this point, we removed the primary tumors, just to keep you guys abreast. Uh, we removed the primary tumors and now we are imaging, um, doing the full body luminescence imaging. Um, so we didn't see any significant difference overall full body luminescence at two weeks, but we did see some si um, signs of metastasis, especially at those original tumor sites that you see in DMSO and AM1241 in the combo, uh, in one in the combina combination treatment group. Um, ironically, we didn't see any um, like strong metastasis in the SD uh group. At three weeks, the signal just got stronger and we kind of see the same as that um, trend, but still no true significant difference between full body luminescence. Um, however, when we actually harvest the organs, we were able to see um, that there was metastasis to the lung as well as the lymph node, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, so we're actually looking at the RFP signals um, that you can see through these red indication. And we look at the number of the actual nodes as well as the percent area of the metastatic nodes and also the lung metastasis percentage of the mice. Um, so we didn't see any significant difference between the treatment groups um, looking at the number of actual metastatic nodes or percentage of metastatic nodes, but we do see that there is a um, reduction in overall incidence rates to that. So that just led us to believe that this combination treatment group could de decrease the incidence rates of um, metastasis to the lung. Furthermore, um, in lymph node, it was pretty much similar across the board. We didn't see any differences. Um, so, um, so overall, we can kind of conclude or lead to um, that the fact that we can we can actually reduce tumor growth through this this combination treatment group as well as decrease um, the incidence rates of lung um, metastasis. But I still need to confirm the actual expression of CXR4 and cannabinoid receptor 2 in these tissues, as well as do approximate ligation. Um, just to further confirm whether or not this heterodyne repair was actually formed. Um, so I would like to acknowledge Clark Atlanta University, my committee members, Dr. Soynova's lab at UCLA, um, both the biology department at Clark Atlanta, as well as the molecular and medical pharmacology department at UCLA, and of course, all of the grants and um, that pretty much supported the research. Okay, so I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. And do, we do have time for a couple of questions. So, Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Have you evaluated um, immune cell infiltration in your models? And have you seen it? Um, so these mice were immune compromised. So that could be some playing factors as well if maybe we can develop a model that has immune cells in them, then we'll probably see maybe a little bit more expression, especially with the CXCR, I mean, yes, the CXCR4 stimulated um, treatment. So that was something that I did discuss with my PI that maybe that could actually up the ante for uh, progression, tumor progression in, in those cell lines, so. Yes. Uh, so like the AM seems to prevent the cells from metastasizing and the uh, SDF seems to increase metastasizing. Why do you suppose that, like, or I just might not have known this, but why is that, that together it seems to work better at preventing metastasizing than just the AM alone? Um, so that's the million dollar question <laughs> that we're trying to figure out. So we're still trying to develop mechanisms to test that. Um, some of the things that I've worked with with another collaborator was actually forming cell lines that had this heterodyne repair and seeing if we can turn it on, turn it off. Um, so that's something that I'm working on as well in conjunction to um, validating this data, if that helps with your question. Yes. Uh, 
Hi, Chanel. Okay, yes, I'm Chanel. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious, you mentioned that this chemokine receptor is expressed, or the CB2 is expressed largely in immune cells. Are there specific subsets of immune cells that express it? And if so, are there different subsets that express this uh, heterodimer pair that you're aware of? Um, so as far as the heterodimer pair, the whole purpose of their idea would be if, say, for example, if we're trying to, if you gave a patient medical marijuana, would this phenomenon happen? Um, so someone mentioned it before, but somewhere where we would like to lead in the future is to actually look at like the cannabis derivatives, either THC, CBD, to see if we can replicate this. But of course, since Georgia has these strict reg regulations and it's only like one institution, which is UGA, who actually has the license to um, treat with medical marijuana, it's been a little bit difficult. Um, so we're trying to navigate and figure out how we can actually kind of go around that for now until you know, politics kind of move along. <laughs> yes. So technically, um, this is a synthetic, like a form of, of, of synthetic cannabinoid. So I, that is another thing. Like I went to a couple conferences and I did see some people working with can, uh, can, um, cannabinoids and they did, I think it was someone in New York, they developed their own cannabinoid. They're still testing it. So I mentioned to my people, like, hey, if we're able to co further collaborate with other people who are developing these synthetic cannabinoids, maybe we can test this phenomenon as well. Um, in the in vitro work we did do, you know, we looked at other, um, like, synthetic cannabinoids as well as different forms of, like, CXCR4 to activate it, and we did see that the phenomenon still happens. So I think as long as you're activating uh, CB2 or CXCR4, this phenomenon would happen. Great. Thank you so much for all your questions and thank you, Nakia.